Hi folks, welcome to this video with a third example on how we handle bonds issued between interest payment dates. We're going to our third example here. We got, we're back to our good old company Barnes and they issued a 9% 20-year bond, $800,000 par, and it's dated January 1st, 2014. Again, interest is paid semi-annually, twice a year, once June 30th, once June, December 31st, and it matures in 20 years, which means the bond term ends at January 1st, 2034. Now, in this case, the bond is sold by the issuer, that's Barnes, the seller, to the investor at par on April 1st, 2014. So you see, we still have a, a bond date that's different from our issue date right here, April 1st, right? So if we look at the timeline now, what do we see? We see that's our bond date, that's our issue date. So from January 1st to April 1st, that's January, February, March, that's three months, right? So now we know that for the investor to get a full six months of interest on June 30th, that is from January 1st to June 30th, they're going to have to pay up front for two months here. That's January 1st to April 1st. That's a full three months interest. So for the investor to get a full six months interest, even though they've only been in the game or holding a bond since April 1st, right? So from April 1st to June 30th is three months as well, right? In order for them to get a full six months, when they've only been here since April 1st, which is three months, they got to pay three months up front, January, February, and March. So when we book our interest expense now, using our little timeline, we know now that the investors are going to give what? They're going to give Barnes $818,000 in cash. Why, where did we get that number? Well, don't forget, they got to give us three months interest in advance. That's from January to March, right? On $800,000 at 9%. Don't forget the rate, unless you're told otherwise, and, and all these questions, it's been annual. So make sure you know, unless you're told otherwise, the interest rate is always annual. So you take your annual rate, multiply it by the face value, and multiply it by the number of months from the bond date to the issue date, and that's three months from January to March. So that means these investors are going to be giving Barnes an $18,000 up front in addition to the face value, which is $800,000. So that's how we get $818. The credit, again, interest payable, because this is the interest that's accrued from January to, a to April 1st. And that's the part of the interest that will be paid back to investors on June the 30th. And we're going to credit our bond payable because that's the amount of the debt that Barnes now has. They have an obligation to give $800,000 back to their investors at the end of 20 years. So now, if we have a look at the um, journal entry at June the 30th, don't forget, June 30th is a regular interest payment date. These guys are going to get the full six months interest. Remember, we said whoever holds the bond is going to get a full six months interest, right? That's what we said here in our little rule. So therefore, these guys are going to get their six month interest payment, which is the credit to cash. But part of that $36,000 credit to cash is a return of the original amount of interest they gave them at January for, or at, at um, April the 1st, which is all that interest from January 1st to April 1st, right? The three months, January, February, March. So if that's included as part of this 36,000, then your interest payable is going away. And now you're booking interest expense for three months. These three months, maybe just put it in here, are the three months from April 1st all the way to June 30th, right? These three months here are not the same three months. These three months are from January 1st to April 1st, right? Two different sets of three month periods, right? So this is the expense for the period ending June 30th, and this is the advance payment that the investors gave that Barnes recorded a liability on. Why? Because they were going to return it when they made their interest payment June 30th. 
And because we're here at June 30th, that's why we debit the interest payable because we're making that cash payment, right? So now you'll notice again, we did not have to make a journal entry on January 1st, the date of the bonds. Why? Because nothing happened that date. We only start making journal entries related to bonds on the date we issue them and for interest down the road. And we made our interest entries. We did an interest entry here on June 30th. And we're also going to do a journal entry for interest on December 31st. So now let's go. Well, I guess we never did. So you know what we're going to do? We're going to do it together while we're here. On December 31st, 2014, what would our entry be? We would debit interest expense for how much? Well, the full 36000 right? Because that's the amount of the cash payment. Now, you might say, well, how come this is different from what we did on uh, June 30th? Well, don't forget, the reason it's different is because when the interest payment was being made on June the 30th, that was the first six months of interest. That has to include a return of the upfront payment that Barnes got from its investors. That was part of that 818, right? We're just taking now on December 31st, when we did this entry here, we're just looking at this little piece here from June the 30th to December 31st, right? So you can see that's the next six month period. So we don't have to worry about this upfront payment like we did here. We don't have that here in the last six months. So it's just a straight interest expense debit and credit to cash. So I'm hoping you found this of some use to you and some help in helping you understand the concepts that we've been reviewing. So in any case, I wish you luck and uh, we'll see you in class.